This is the second in a series of videos on the Section 951 Cap A inclusion. These rules apply to U.S. persons owning 10% or more of the shares of a controlled foreign corporation. There's a link below to the first and third videos. If you haven't watched the first one yet, you probably should before tackling this one. Section 951 Cap A applies to every 10% or more U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation. Such shareholder must include in his income, every year after 2017, his share of the aggregate of income of all his CFCs in excess of 10% aggregate return on assets of his CFCs. This inclusion is in addition to subpart F inclusions. Initial calculations of income and 10% amounts are done at the CFC level and exclude subpart F income. Such amounts are then allocated among shareholders based on profit sharing percentages. These allocated income and 10% amounts are aggregated separately by each U.S. shareholder who calculates his own net inclusion. In this video, I'll cover the following how to determine the 10% return on assets, how to determine the shareholder's pro rata share of income and assets. This is based on actual ownership without attribution rules. And finally, how to aggregate amounts from the various CFCs in which the U.S. person owns 10% or more. The assets number for the 10% return includes only tangible depreciable property. Intangible assets don't count. Land doesn't count. It's not depreciable. But land improvements are depreciable, so they do count. So do plant, machinery, equipment, vehicles, dairy cows, fruit trees, a whole host of things. Whether it's depreciable depends on U.S. tax law, not foreign law. The only assets that count are those used in a trade or business of the CFC. You may say, well, everything in a CFC must be a trade or business. That's not true. Some things may be held for investment. That raises the hundred-year-old question of what level of activity is needed for something to be a business, not an investment. The definitions under sections 199 Cap A and 469 don't apply here. You must look at court cases. The last I looked, there were over a thousand cases and rulings on what is a business. The 10% amount is 10% of the adjusted basis of depreciable tangible property. Thus, you must determine cost and reduce it by accumulated depreciation. Again, all this is done under U.S. tax principles. Remember, a bigger 10% amount is a good thing, usually. Let's look at the assets for our example company, Berg's Limited. Some of the assets clearly qualify and some clearly don't. Remember from last time that Berg's runs a hamburger business. The restaurant building and equipment qualify. The cash, inventory, land, and intangibles don't. The big open question is that rental building. What's the level of activity that Berg's Limited has with respect to the building? Is it a triple net lease? If so, the rental building does not qualify as a business. Probably a bad thing. In that case, the income should be treated as subpart F passive basket income. Also probably a bad thing. If Berg's provides maintenance and other services related to the building, then the building probably qualifies for the 10% amount. This question of whether rental activities qualify as a trade or business has been relevant in subpart F since 1962, and it's now also very relevant for 951 Cap A. It's often irrelevant for U.S. activities of U.S. taxpayers. A few key points outside 951 Cap A itself are worth noting at this point. The passive activity rules of Section 469 are irrelevant here. Asset basis or cost is determined in the functional currency of the CFC, and so is depreciation. 
basis of assets acquired in a non-taxable transaction, like merger or contribution to capital, carries over to the CFC from the transferor. Depreciation must be determined using the class life of assets with a class life and using the straight line method. All the amounts are then translated to dollars. The proposed regulations under 951 Cap A state that only assets of a CFC that has positive earnings in the year are used in calculating the 10% amount. This seems to me to be contrary to the statute. It certainly leaves a lot of room for my favorite thing, manipulation. It also means that the aggregate assets of a particular shareholder could swing wildly from year to year due to particular CFCs dropping in and out of the calculation. All this basis stuff requires a lot of record keeping that may not be done each year, or at all, by the CFC. The onus is on the U.S. shareholder. I'll talk more about this and other implementation issues in the last video. Finally, once the total adjusted basis of depreciable tangible property has been computed for all relevant CFCs, the next step is easy. Multiply that total by 10%. 951 Cap A also requires that the 10% amount be reduced by net interest expense. Not all interest expense, though. Just that interest expense deducted in computing the income subject to inclusion it also excludes interest paid to a related party that is included in subpart F income of that related party. So, interest means some of the CFC's interest expense less some of its interest income. You have to analyze it and do tracing under the subpart F related person interest rules. The interest expense and income amounts for each CFC are apportioned among assets. Then the amounts apportioned to 951 Cap A assets are reported to the shareholder as net interest expense, and the aggregate of these nets reduces the shareholder's aggregate 10% amount. If there are no related CFCs and no subpart F income, the interest part is not too hard. Just reduce interest expense by interest income and apportion the net interest expense among assets using respective adjusted bases. You did rework the local book amounts of income, interest, and assets for U.S. tax principles, right? <laughs> yeah. Then reduce the 10% return on assets amount by this net apportioned interest expense. Let's go back to our Berg's example to see how this net interest stuff works. Assume the rental building was not a trader business and Berg's had 500000 of interest expense. This interest is apportioned among the $50 million of assets, with $210,000 of interest expense apportioned to the 951 Cap A assets. The $2.1 million amount for the 10% is reduced by the $210,000 of interest, leaving the return on assets number at $1.89 million. Each U.S. shareholder must include in income its share of the non-rental income less its share of the $1.89 million, but not below zero, plus its share of the subpart F income from the rental building. That's the super simple example, really. Beyond that, the one page of proposed regulations covering this interest stuff get really hard really fast. Beyond this, it actually gets easier, as long as there's only one class of shares in the CFC. By one class, I mean all the shares have the same distribution rights. Voting rights are ignored here. With just one class of shares, just multiply the various amounts for each U.S. shareholder by their percentage of the distribution rights owned. You need to do this separately for each of the 951 Cap A inclusion, 10% return on assets, and interest amounts. 
Each shareholder aggregates the 10% amount and interest items separately on their own before netting them. However, if differing shareholders participate in profits differently, it gets really hard. New regulations proposed under Section 951 explicitly apply to 951 Cap A. New proposed Section 1.951-1E defines pro rata share by reference to a hypothetical distribution of the 951 and 951 Cap A inclusions and determining who would get how much of those distributions. Distributions that would be treated for U.S. tax purposes as returns of capital, distributions in redemption of stock, or liquidation are excluded. These aspects have applied to subpart F for years, but now it doesn't stop there. If there are redeemable preferred shares, whatever that means, whose dividends do not compound at a rate of at least the applicable federal rate for each period, then special adjustments apply. If there are restrictions or limitations on distributions, other than currency ones, they are ignored with exceptions. Now it actually does get simple. As the final step, each U.S. shareholder puts his pieces together. Just add up the positive net incomes and the losses separately. Then reduce the positives by the losses. Then add up the 10% amounts and net interest amounts for each positive income CFC and separately for each loss CFC. The proposed regs say use only the amounts from the CFCs with positive income that year and ignore the loss company ones. That's not what the law says, but it's in the proposed regulations. Net the interest against the 10% amounts, then reduce the positive incomes by this net 10% amount. The result is your total 951 Cap A inclusion. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to read Section 951 Cap A. It's only two pages of fine print in my paperback copy of the code. You should also read the parts of the proposed regulations that may apply for your clients. Both are free online at the locations linked below.